Hey guys and welcome back to my channel for another video in my history series where today we're going to be talking about one of the most bizarre disasters in history the Great Molasses Flood of 1919 that happened in Boston, Massachusetts It's one of those disasters that although tragic and it did lead to many deaths and serious injury it changed the course of history, it was this learning moment and it changed laws and regulations across the USA and the world to ensure that it never happens again. It's the kind of event that received loads of press coverage at the time, it was insane and then it kind of just faded from public memory. Of course this video is sponsored by Magellan TV, who I have a long-standing sponsorship with. They're a streaming service dedicated purely to documentaries and you know, each month I like to make a couple of recommendations of documentaries that you should watch, starting this time with History's Verdict, Hero or Villain. This is actually a 10 part series, each episode's about an hour long, so you can really get stuck in there. It's about a number of world leaders throughout the 20th century and it takes a fresh perspective as to whether they're really better or worse than history portrays them. There's episodes on Churchill, Roosevelt, Hirohito, Mussolini and more. And you even get to look into some once secret declassified government documents. I've still got a couple of episodes left of this series and I don't want to finish it because it's so good. And the second documentary is a complete 180 on that with the surprising history of sex and love. I find any documentary looking at human behaviour around sex and love so interesting and Magellan actually have a surprising amount of documentaries available in this genre but the history of sex and love is the newest one. It takes a look at how society has been changed throughout history, shaped by romance, sexuality and passion, how history has gone from being fairly open about sex to strict sexual oppression to being much more open and honest again today for the most part. I find this is an aspect of history that's often overlooked but it's fascinating to me. Magellan TV have everything from true crime, science, history, nature and everything in between with new programmes added weekly you can be watched anywhere on your TV, laptop and mobile. It's compatible with Roku, Amazon Fire TV, Google Play and iOS and loads of programmes are available in 4K. If you enjoy my channel then honestly you will really really enjoy Magellan TV. There's never been a better time to dedicate your time to educating yourself and learning something new. Or you can even give a loved one the gift of documentaries with the Magellan TV gift cards that they now offer. As I said, this story takes place in Boston on the 15th of January 1919, when a steel tank burst and sent more than 2 million gallons of molasses racing through the city's north end in a 25 foot wave. 21 people died, animals died, more than 150 people were injured and buildings were flattened. But how did this come to happen? In the years leading up to 1919, molasses were a substance sought after by many. Molasses are a thick syrup that's formed as a byproduct of the sugar making process from crushed sugar cane or sugar beets. It's a thick, dark brown, sticky, viscous liquid. It's the kind of thing where if you get it on your hands, you're going to want to wash them a few times to get rid of any trace of the stickiness. It's edible and is used in a variety of different ways, nowadays mostly in the making of sweets and in baking, but it's also used in animal feed and in industrial production. Back in the time we're talking about here though, it was most commonly used to make rum and in the making of industrial alcohol, which was then bought across the USA and in England and France to be used to make explosives. As we all know, World War I ran from 1914 to 1918 and explosives were kind in high demand at this time and therefore, so was molasses. In 1915, the United States Industrial Alcohol Company built a 50 foot tall storage tank in the north end of Boston to serve its subsidiary, Purity Distilling Company of Boston, which made both high grade rum and industrial alcohol for explosives. The tank was deliberately placed close to the harbour so they could easily transfer the molasses being brought in on boats from the Caribbean and close to the railway for easy transportation from there to the manufacturing plant in Cambridge. It was placed in a poor Italian immigrant neighbourhood of course and it wasn't the most sightly of things and the Italians were powerless to stop it so there it was placed. The tank was 50 feet tall and 90 feet across with the ability to hold 2.5 million gallons of molasses, which I think is about 9.5 million litres. I actually learned in the process of making this video that UK and US gallons are actually very different measurements. A UK gallon is 4.5 litres whilst the US gallon is 3.8 litres. 
the more you know. When the tank was constructed in 1915, it was made in a hurry to make sure the businesses could take advantage of lucrative war contracts coming in. Being a container and not a building, it was never subject to any building regulations or permits. There was nobody overseeing the construction to make sure it was safe. There was no testing, so this company could basically put it up as quickly as they needed. The manager of the project was a man called Arthur Gell. He was the United States Industrial Alcohol Company's treasurer, and he had no experience in this area. He had no technical experience, no architectural experience, no engineering experience, just no experience at all. The steel that they used for the tank was not of adequate thickness, and we know today that this particular type of steel they used can be quite brittle. It should not be used to hold that much weight. But there was a big shipment of molasses coming in, so they were on a really tight schedule just to get the tank finished. They didn't care, they just needed it to be finished. This first shipment of molasses came in from Cuba before the tank could even be properly tested for leaks. So Gel, in his rush, puts in six inches of water in the bottom of the tank and just declares it safe for use. The tank was loaded up with the molasses. But as we'll come to discover in this video, water and molasses are two very different substances which cannot be compared. So the tank was filled and it didn't take long for locals to start realising that the tank was leaking, dripping molasses down onto the street below. Parents would literally send their children out with buckets to collect it so they could use it in their baking for free. The United States Industrial Alcohol Company was informed of these leaks, but instead of actually doing something to stop it, they just decided to paint the tank brown to hide the leaking joints. Yeah. Over the next four years, the local residents got very used to hearing the constant creaks and groans of the tank. They could tell how full it was by how much it sounded like the metal was struggling underneath the weight. The company knew about it, they just didn't really care. The years passed and the residents just got slightly used to the constant creaking and groaning and the fact that molasses was just everywhere and it was all sticky. January 12th, 13th, 1919, yet another huge delivery of molasses came in. 600,000 gallons pumped in from a ship in Boston Harbour into the tank, almost filling it to capacity. There was already molasses in there. The tank wasn't to be full for that long though, they had plans to slowly transfer all the molasses over to Cambridge over the course of the next few days. But of course, it was too little too late. The tank had quite literally reached its breaking point. January 15th started a day like any other for the Boston residents, but it was unseasonably warm, meaning that many people had left their homes for the day and were just out in the street. Just after the noon, the tank, filled to the brim with molasses, finally gave up. The steel walls ruptured and 2.3 million gallons of molasses came flying out at speed. This thick, viscous, sticky liquid surging through the neighbourhood. There wasn't much warning before it happened, apart from the standard groans and creaks coming from the tank, but it made noises like that every single day. A tidal wave of molasses swept across Commercial Street, smashing into homes and businesses and destroying them in seconds. The molasses moved at a rate of 50 foot per second, so there was no way to outrun it if you were in its path. It was like something you'd see in a cartoon, people drowning in this thick sugar syrup. But this wasn't funny, it was real life and a truly horrific way to die. People didn't so much as drown in the molasses as asphyxiate. Humans, dogs and horses all stood no chance. You couldn't fight your way through it, it was too sticky, too thick. And if you didn't drown in it, then it destroyed your home, killing you via falling debris. Parts of the Boston Elevated Railway Company's Atlantic Avenue line, which ran above Commercial Street, was struck by parts of this exploded tank, causing sections of the railway to collapse. The Bay Street Railway freight depot was destroyed, and a fireboat on the waterfront was sunk in the dock, causing death. A house on nearby Copse Hill Terrace was completely destroyed, killing a Mrs Bridget Clowerty inside. Isaac Yetton was working outside, hauling tubes into a shed when he heard this snapping sound. He saw an electric railway car coming towards him at speed, along with other debris. So he begins to run towards the harbour, but of course he can't outrun the molasses. He's carried in this way for 35 foot before being slammed against the door. He managed to survive just covered in molasses and he was saved by a foreman who threw down a ladder for him, but he was one of the luckier ones. 
78 year old Elizabeth O'Brien was walking out of her home to do the washing outside whilst chatting with her sister. Before she knew it, she'd been hit with the molasses, later testifying, it knocked me down and tipped the tub over me. It broke her jaw and completely destroyed her home. In the aftermath of it, she lost track of her sister, only finding her in hospital days later, having suffered a stroke and disfigurement. All in all, 21 people died and so many were seriously injured. The force with which people were hit by the molasses caused any number of broken bones. Some just had an arm or leg broken, others had their pelvises, spines, necks, skulls shattered. Some weren't even hit by the molasses itself, but by the debris flung around by it. Ten-year-old Pascali Ian Tosca was struck and killed by a train car that had been swept from the tracks. In just a matter of minutes, people's lives have been changed forever. And then the molasses just settled to a depth of two or three feet across the north end of Boston. Help soon arrived at the scene, the first being the 116 cadets who'd been aboard the USS Nantucket, which was docked nearby. They saw everything. Then the police, the Red Cross and the army arrived, setting up makeshift hospitals to tend to the wounded once they'd managed to escape this sticky substance. I can imagine the hardest thing of such a disaster is figuring out where the hell do you begin? How do you even begin to deal with this? The recovery process was a long one and whilst they found the majority of the victims within the next few days, bodies would still pop up in unexpected places for months. It took weeks to clear the area, 87,000 man hours in total. They had to use salt water to wash away what they could of the molasses and then dump sand to try and absorb it. It's said that the harbour was brown with molasses for months afterwards. Just imagine how sticky everything was, streets, buildings, trains. But then there were also the people coming to visit the area to see what happened and then they would traipse the molasses through the streets of the rest of Boston all of Boston was just sticky. As someone who's carried around anti back constantly with them for years because the thought of any kind of stickiness makes me sick, I can't even think about this too much. Just so much stickiness everywhere. It took a long, long time for this area of Boston to be cleared up. The worst thing is that the night of the flood, the temperatures went down to freezing and therefore the sugar in the molasses hardened. Bodies literally had to be chiselled out over the coming days. The Suffolk County Medical Examiner said that many of the bodies looked as though they were covered in heavy oil skins, eyes and ears, mouth and noses filled. But the big question here is why did this all happen? Like we know the basics of the tank being overfilled, metal not strong enough and boom. But we all know that I like to go in depth here on this channel so we're going to look at a bit of science, it's all physics. Although it is worth saying that I couldn't find any one person on the internet being like this is exactly what happened inside the tank to cause it to explode. Like even the most fantastic physicists can't say exactly what it was because this happened over a hundred years ago but they have a good enough idea. So this happened in January where as we covered just a second ago Boston had sub freezing temperatures as is normal for them. But then they had a sudden warm snap, a week in which the weather was much fairer, much more like spring. The night before the flood happened though, the temperatures dipped to just below freezing. So the molasses in the tank would have been going through temperatures going up and down unusually often in the weeks before the explosion. And then the new drop of molasses got delivered just two days beforehand. Hot molasses straight from the ships mixed with the cold molasses in the tank. This may well have triggered a fermentation process and produced gas. The tank did have a single vent inside which should have allowed the gas to escape, but somebody had actually closed it. So you've got this poorly constructed tank made of brittle steel holding over 2 million gallons of molasses. But the molasses are also producing gas which can't escape. Local residents reported that the tank had been groaning more in the days beforehand, but sometimes it just did that, so nobody was hugely concerned by it. Until the still gave away, the pressure release and the molasses escaped the tank a hell of a lot faster than you'd generally expect molasses to move. You'd think a liquid that thick and sticky wouldn't have the ability to move as fast as it did, but as Nicole Sharp, an aerospace engineer, explained to NPR, you basically have a giant stack of something that's really heavy and as soon as you remove whatever's holding that, in this case the walls of the tank, 
all of that's going to rush out. A lot of that potential energy that you had from stacking this thing up really high is going to turn into kinetic energy. It might as well be a tsunami. It was also quite warm in that tank thanks to the new hot molasses from the ships, meaning that the molasses were thinner and quicker to move, but as soon as it hit the cold Boston air, it started to thicken up. Had the tank exploded in the middle of summer, it probably would have been quite as deadly as it was. But then again, there's a reason it exploded when it did in the middle of winter. Although the mess took weeks and weeks to clear up, that was just the beginning. As you can guess, there was a lengthy legal battle to follow. This was someone's fault, but whose was it? The legal proceedings would take six years to complete, with 125 lawsuits in total filed by survivors and families of the victims against the owners of the tank, the Purity Distilling Company and their owner, United States Industrial Alcohol Company, which would soon turn into one of Massachusetts' first class action suits filed on behalf of 119 victims and families. The case, Dorr vs the United States Industrial Alcohol Company, went on in court for six whole years, with the families arguing that improper testing and construction of the tank had led to its collapse. But the company tried to argue that the explosion was actually caused by Italian anarchists. Apparently they'd received threats from Italian anarchists in the past and they basically wanted to blame anyone but themselves. Over the course of the lawsuit, they heard testimony from more than 3,000 witnesses. But a couple of years into the suit, an auditor called Hugh W. Ogden was brought on board. He was also a conservative businessman and would have had concerns about excessive government regulations and interference in business. Which is crazy to imagine now, like back in 1919, companies thought that having government set regulations for general health and safety was excessive interference, which is insane. But Ogden also believed in fairness and justice, and in this case he had to side with the victims of the floods. The United States Industrial Alcohol Company were to blame, they were found fully at fault in 1925, and they were forced to pay out huge amounts of money in settlements. $6,000 to each victim and $30,000 to the city for damages, amongst other payments as well. 6,000 is about 90,000 today adjusted for inflation. Although I must say, I did see amounts ranging from what I just told you to a million dollars to nine million dollars, so I'm not sure on the exact amount the company had to pay out, it was just a lot of money. It was one of the first times really that a big corporation had to take the blame for negligence. Generally, business owners could get away with doing whatever they wanted with little consequence because money is the most important thing. It was proven beyond doubt that the company had engaged no one with any engineering or architectural expertise to review the plans created by Hammond Ironworks, either in the planning stage or after construction. Nor had they asked any other experts inside USIA to analyse the construction. Even when people came to them with concerns after the construction, they didn't pay any attention whatsoever. It was negligence and they couldn't argue otherwise. This disaster led to a huge shift in American public policy. Cities and states had to overhaul how they evaluated and regulated construction standards. You couldn't get away with shitty building work anymore, everything had to be proven to be safe and well made. Which sounds very much like the bare minimum, but without the Great Molasses Flood happening, how many more years of smaller scale accidents would have had to have gone by before a change like this was actually made? I can't help but wonder how many lives were inadvertently saved off of the back of such a tragic disaster. There's been long-standing positive ramifications because of this. Even the materials used to build, such as concrete and steel, became subject to strict regulations. Business people were furious, but change had been slowly happening for many years. I mean, the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory fire had happened just eight years earlier, leaving 146 people dead and fire safety regulations were tightened on the back of this, leaving many business owners furious at the extra work. I mean, that's insane, isn't it? Before 1911, fire safety was barely a thought. Neither was any other form of safety, it seems. The molasses flood marked the beginning of an era where big businesses finally had to deal with government restrictions and consequences if they didn't follow them. Restrictions and consequences that still stand today. Now, a playground and baseball field sit where a tank stood 101 years ago, with only a small plaque to mark the spot. 
Most people wouldn't even notice it and visitors to the area probably have no idea that once these streets were coated in molasses. But lots of locals still claim to this day that in the summer when the old buildings and grounds heat up you can still smell the sweet molasses. I'd love for any native Bostonians to confirm or deny this in the comments. If you're from Boston, do you ever smell the molasses? Thank you so much for watching this video. Like always, if you've got any other history video requests, then please make sure you leave them in the comments down below. And I'll see you in the next one. Bye, guys.